focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines here on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, we have our usual Friday reporters in Son Bogyang and Kwon Soa. Guys, welcome back. Happy Friday. Friday. Happy Fridays to you guys as well. We're going to start things off with domestic politics. Uh, today is the last day for candidates of the PPP uh, leadership election to register. We've been talking about this uh, throughout the week uh, and last week as well. We talked about specifically Na Gyeong Won, who was at one point the uh, sort of the front runner in that race there. Uh, surprisingly, with her approval rating, she was in the lead. Uh, and then it was uh, Kim gi as and then uh, An Char Su. Things have switched around. But nevertheless, let's talk about who registered until today, the final day, and what we can expect in this PPP leadership election year. Bo Gyeong, you're going to start us off here. Right. So candidacy registration for the People Power Party's leadership uh, uh, leadership positions that started yesterday closed today at 5 p.m. Contenders such as Kim Gi Hyun, An Chul Su, Yoon Sang Hyun, and Chu Kyung Tae have all applied for candidacy. Other candidates include former Prime Minister and representative of the former Mire Tongapdang, Hwang Gyo Wan, and Kang Shin Up, an attorney and former head of First Lady Kim Gon Hee's fan club. After receiving the applications until today, the Election Management Committee of the People Power Party will review the qualifications of the candidates and select four chairman candidates for the cutoff by February 10th. The National Convention will be held on March 8th to elect the new leader. So quite an interesting uh, lineup there. An attorney and a former head of First Lady Kim gun fan club included in this as well. Well, we're going to be talking about someone who hasn't been dealing, uh, we haven't been dealing with uh, much in the, uh, the past months or so, but uh, he was uh, someone that we've talked about extensively, uh, or at least covered on the headlines extensively uh, a few years ago. We're talking about Cho Guk, the former justice minister uh, from the previous Moon administration. Uh, he has now been sentenced to two years in prison. This on um, charges including bribery. Uh, so well, let's get the details of the uh, trial here. Sure. Cho Guk, a former justice minister, received a two-year prison term on Friday, although the court did not imprison him right away. Uh, his charges are abuse of his influence to secure academic benefits for his kids, including admission to universities. The Seoul Central District Court also found him guilty of interfering in investigations into a corruption case by using his position as a presidential advisor. So in going into the details now, Chu was indicted on a dozen charges in 2019, including for fabricating documents to help his two children enroll in colleges and graduate programs, including a medical school. In addition, Chu was accused of accepting bribes totaling 6 million won or roughly 4,900 US dollars in the form of a scholarship for his daughter who went to a medical school in the city of Busan. He was charged once more with abusing his uh, position as a presidential aide to halt an investigation into bribery claims involving a former vice mayor of Busan. So, this Friday, the court ordered the former minister to a fine of 6 million won, or $4,900, finding him responsible for the majority of the academic fraud allegations. According to the court, quote, the defendant's offense is serious in that he frequently committed the crime for several years while working as a university professor. It further stated that Cho is heavily to blame for undermining society's justice in the admissions process. For schools. Uh, he, however, was cleared by the court of several allegations uh, related to shady private equity investments made by his family, though. Cho appreciated the court's clearing of those allegations uh, and declared, though, he will appeal. Now, the prosecution, who sought a five-year prison sentence, uh, is also expected to appeal the court's decision. In the same ruling, the court also sentenced Cho's wife, Jung Kyung Shim, for a one-year prison term as an accomplice in the educational fraud. Chung already has been serving a four-year term for forging her daughter's academic cred credentials and documents for her son. Uh, Zhou Guk, meanwhile, a popular professor of law at Seoul National University, served as a senior presidential secretary for civil affairs from 2017 to 2019, and he was appointed as justice minister in 2019, September 
uh, and then stepped down just a month later on the heels of this big scandal. Yeah, and uh, I do remember uh, this whole incident with uh, Cho Guk at the time uh, when he was uh, very, for a very, very brief time, I believe, uh, the justice minister. Uh, this whole scandal here was ultimately one of the main reasons for why, at the time, uh, the ruling Democratic Party, uh, their approval rating started sinking. And of course, through this, uh, President Yoon Sagir, who was at the time attorney general, uh, his kind of presence started going up. And a lot of people said this sort of incident and kind of turned the tides here and ultimately led uh, to President Yoon Sagir getting right. a great deal of support from the uh, the conservatives and eventually uh, winning the presidential election uh, last year. So uh, quite a huge huge uh, incident in a, uh, in the, uh, I guess a, a controversy here that ultimately uh, came to an end here. But we did say that there was uh, some appeal process going on here. We'll find out whether or not there's any kind of changes uh, to the sentencing. Let's talk economy this time. An Economic Research Institute estimating South Korea's growth rate uh, to stand at 1.5%. This is actually a downtick from their previous outlook, I believe. And it's also uh, lower than the estimate by the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Bogey, going to give us the uh, details of this. Sure. So it is a gloomy prospect. The Korea Economic Research Institute announced on Friday that it had downgraded South Korea's growth outlook from the previous 1.9% to 1.5%. Last year, the institute projected the country's growth rate for 2023 to stand at 1.9%, but downward adjusted it by 0.4 percentage point due to the accelerating economic contraction observed late last year. And you know, 1.5% is 0.2 percentage point lower than 1.7%, which is the growth rate projected by the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. According to the Institute, South Korea is likely to go into a recession this year as the country does not have any growth momentums that can help the economy to overcome global recession. A research fellow of the Institute said that if the Fed continues with its radical belt tightening policies or the excessively high level of household debt leads to a financial crisis, the downward trend will exacerbate. Also, excessive financial spending during the pandemic contributed to the overall downgrade as well. As for the domestic sector, private spending, which takes up the largest portion, is expected to grow by 2.4 percent. Last year's private spending growth rate was 4.4 percent, which means this year's spending will grow just half the level of last year. The Federation of Korean in Industries projected that overall spending will substantially shrink as self-employed businesses are making less money and high interest rates act as huge burdens for those with household debts. As for facility investment, despite aggressive investment of the semiconductor sector, the growth rate of the sector will be minus 2.5 percent because of higher financing costs. In the meanwhile, thanks to global raw material prices leveling off, consumer price will stand at 3.4 percent, which is 1.7 percentage point less than last year. Yeah, and so now moving forward here, the, the big question is going to be whether or not the BOK is going to continue to increase its interest rates because uh, we talked about earlier this week, uh, the U.S. Fed, I mean, they made a step, small step, right, 25 basis points, which still uh, they're at a relatively high level of, uh, I believe, 4.5 to 4.75% range, which is still a significant gap uh, with the BOK's interest rate. And so I think it's not going to be like a, a big step moving forward for the Bank of Korea, but still, even for a small step of 25 basis point, it's still a, a big deal of burden for all the, uh, the homeowners who, again, uh, bought all these houses. Uh, with the money that they didn't have, take out loans left and right. Uh, they're already suffering from uh, all these uh, high interest rates on their mortgages. So uh, not surprising that they did downgrade the economic outlook for uh, South Korea here. But on par with this outlook, South Korea's finance minister, Chu kyung ho uh, had some perspectives on the domestic economy at a meeting this Friday, also laid out some efforts the government is doing in tackling these economic woes. Uh, so you have the details of this. Right. The finance minister and other economy-related ministers got together for a closed-door emergency meeting this Friday to discuss ways to handle worrisome prospects in the current economy. In his remarks ahead of the meeting, Chu predicted that 
that for at least the first half of this year, exports are to remain sluggish, referring to weak figures from the past four months as of October. In terms of inflation, he noted worsened on-month data in January, adding though that it was in line with initial expectations due to rising electricity rates and product price adjustments. For the time being, he expected inflation to hover around 5%, but that uh, the latter half is predicted to show some uh, stabilization. What he said the government plans to do to alleviate economic concerns is, uh, for instance, for exporters, extensive support in the form of an unprecedented trade financing of roughly 360 trillion won, that's close to 293 billion US dollars, as well as 81 trillion won, roughly 66 billion dollars for a corporate facility investment and research and development projects are to be injected. The government also vowed to attract foreign investment of more than 30 billion US dollars for the year of 2023. Finance Minister Chu also mentioned plans to expand financial incentive distributions in a bid to stabilize local government utility rates. And for that, uh, discussions with uh, specific municipalities will be strengthened as well. Utility rates, we know, have been affected a lot by recent cold waves. And what else has been affected due to low temperatures were prices of certain agricultural, livestock and fisheries products, which is why the government looks to select certain items whose prices have soared on a weekly basis and then provide 20% discount support for such items. Tariff adjustments for specific products uh, will also be put in place, for instance, for mackerel. Is that the word mackerel mackerel for kudungo and also chicken? Yeah, mackerel is interesting because uh, it's supposed to be one of the cheaper uh, fish back in the mm-hmm. days, and which is why it was always. And also, you know, parents thought that by eating mackerels, you, you know, their kids will get smart, right? And so mm-hmm. this was uh, a dish that was always like kind of available in each household. But now the prices of this is uh, skyrocketing. Now it's no longer the same anymore. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the industry ministry announcing plans to support export and investment of manufacturing industries as well. Uh, Pogan, tell us uh, what the plan is here. Right. So the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy held an emergency economic ministerial meeting today and announced plans to closely support South Korea's manufacturing industry. As you know, semiconductor is one of the major export items of the country. But projections are that the industry will have to undergo a tough time in the first half of this year due to a short-term fall in prices. Facility investment already had started to drop since the fourth quarter of last year due to a sluggish economy and high interest rates. Export slump has been continuing for four consecutive months, and the trade balance has been on the red for 11 consecutive months. In fact, last month's trade deficit recorded 12.6 billion U.S. dollars, which is the first time since 1956 to exceed 10 billion U.S. dollars. However, there's also a bright side. The ministry expects sectors such as automobile, battery and shipbuilding to experience export growth, and that 10 major manufacturing industries plan to invest around 100 trillion Korean won, which is the same level of last year. So then what is the ministry's plan? The industry ministry plans to spend two-thirds of its export budget in the first half of this year, which is when exports are expected to drop the most. A whopping 360 trillion Korean won will be provided for trade financing, and the ministry will also help businesses to acquire overseas certifications more easily to tap overseas markets. In terms of taxation, the ministry will closely work with the National Assembly to increase tax credits for companies doing investment and developing strategic technologies. Let's uh, talk uh, more about uh, interest rate hikes, but uh, we're going to go over to the the European bloc this time because uh, there was a big step made in Europe. The European Central Bank and the Bank of England hiking their interest rates on Thursday while saying no more is to come here. More is to Uh, come. More is to come there. (laughs) That's even more surprising because historically when you look at, uh, for example, especially the European Central Bank, they're not really known to increase a whole lot. And they've always been kind of keeping theirs very near zero is one of the benefits of, I guess, being in Europe. But so uh, since you're saying that more is to come and they've Mm -hmm. already made this big step, what levels are 
the rates and what expect, what's expected to uh, go on further? Well, at its first meeting of year 2023, the ECB or European Central Bank raised its three main interest rates by 50 basis points. That's 3%, 3.25% and 2.5% for the main refinancing rate, the marginal lending rate and the deposit interest rate. And that'll be in the effect from February 8th. The ECB's Governing Council said in a statement Thursday it will continue to gradually raise interest rates to levels that are sufficiently high to guarantee that inflation reaches its medium-term target of 2% in a timely manner. In light of this came the increase of the three major ECB interest rates, and it intends to do so again at its next monetary policy meeting in March. And that's expected to be another half a point, but we'll have to wait Mm. and see. Uh, Following the announcement, ECB President Christine Lagarde told reporters... We know that we have ground to cover. We know that we are not done. Adding uh, the ECB's determination to getting inflation back to its 2% target should not be questioned. On the current economic situation, she noted price pressures remain significant in part due to the high energy costs widespread across the economy. On a slightly positive note, she also said, quote, overall, the economy has proved more resilient than expected and should improve over the coming quarters. The Bank of England also increased interest rates on Thursday from 3.5% to 4%, and that's the 10th consecutive time. Uh, A hike by 50 basis points, referred to as a big step, comes for the second straight month. Hinted during the Monetary Policy Committee meeting on Thursday, there were uh, hints that in the coming months, smaller hikes may be up. Now, for both the ECB and the BOE, benchmark interest rates are at their highest levels since 2008. Meanwhile, the steps made again in Europe uh, are bigger moves than the U.S.'s Federal Reserve, which on Wednesday just raised its key rate by a quarter percentage point, as you mentioned, SJ, from 4.5 to 4.75 percent. Yeah, and then the only reason for that is because the, the Bank of, uh, sorry, the U.S. Fed was one of the earliest to start raising its uh, rates, right? right? And so I think everyone else were kind of slow on this. And again, uh, the the uh, the European Bank, it's, it's not known, the European Central Bank is now known to really raise rates a whole lot. That they're kind of been they've been stable uh, and they've been uh, near zero and so a lot of people might be saying well I mean a three percent range that doesn't seem like a whole lot compared to the United States at like four point five to four point seven five but you have to understand historically but my question is here is I know at least here in South Korea because it's uh, the three point what is it like three three point three percent three point two five percent range uh, for the uh, the European bloc there. Uh, South Korea, it's very similar to what South Korea is, right? There's something around like uh, 3.5%, I believe, is uh, the Bank of Korea's uh, interest rates. But a lot of people here in South Korea feel uh, the burden on the interest rates hikes that we've been experiencing. My question now is, and I know we have a number of our listeners from the, uh, we have Polino from the UK. We, I know we have uh, Patrick. Patrick, I didn't see Patrick today, but Patrick Pierce, if you're uh, tuning into our program, do tell us. I wonder if the Europeans are also feeling the burden of the interest rate hikes because there's uh, cases a little bit serious with the inflation rates. Their inflation rates uh, in that European bloc is the highest amongst, I believe, some of the major economies that we've talked about. Valley. The U.S. is something like 7%. The, uh, the European bloc is like about 10%. Here in South Korea, I, don't, I hate to say only, mm. but it's only 5.2%, something like that. And so um, that's probably the reason why the European Central Bank is going more, more aggressive and the Bank of England is also starting to get more aggressive on their interest rate hikes because they're seeing the impacts of these higher interest rates from like the U.S., South Korea, for instance, and we're starting to see like the inflation levels go down. But I do wonder if it's sort of the same thing because I think the main uh, problem with higher interest rates for us here in South Korea is that they just bought too many houses. Everyone bought houses, and it's the mortgage uh, interest rates that's the big burden. But I wonder if it's the same thing uh, over in uh, Europe as well. So if you have any information on that, if you're living in the European region, uh, tell us if you feel the brunt of the uh, the burden you get from the uh, higher interest rates here. 
Mm, SJ, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, kind of started with its uh, uh, big steps and mm -hmm. even giant step uh, before. So I think uh, after that, many countries have been following suit. Mm -hmm. And now as the U.S. seems to be easing its uh, hikes, maybe we will also see Europe, Korea and other countries uh, following suit again. And then we'll see how the rest of the year looks yeah, like. Yeah, but like South Korea, for instance, they were sort of, they weren't too late on the interest rates uh, hikes. I wouldn't say they were one of the first to do so, but they were sort of on par with, uh, with mm. the United States. I think it's every time the U.S. Fed was in raising interest rates, the Bank of Korea was doing the same thing. It's just that the Bank of Korea can't do giant steps. They can't go 75 basis points. I mean, the, even when we did 50 basis points, we're like, oh my goodness, South Korea, huge, yeah. Bank of Korea, 50 basis points, that's major. And so they kept on making these giant steps and then, you know, 50 basis points, South Korea kind of matched them with the 50 basis points and they're going to match them with the 25. They just couldn't keep up. But I'm, I'm wondering whether or not the, the European banks are going to be doing as well. Uh, Chris Rhodes, thank you very much for chiming in, uh, says uh, he's from the UK. Inflation here in the UK is still very high. Gas bill hasn't gone down food is still going up housing prices are out of control it's a joke we've got to think of the poor old energy <laughs> what? he said we got to think about the poor old energy companies uh, a lot of sarcasm going on there uh, but again even with the the the, uh, the interest rates right I mean the, I want to know if that's a big burden on you I don't know if you have any like money you've borrowed or mortgages or anything like that but I, I am very much curious here Guys, uh, let's move on to some uh, diplomacy-related news here. Foreign Minister Park Jin, uh, of course, over in Washington, uh, holding the talks with U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And uh, they both reaffirmed the nation's priority as uh, North Korea, as we've been seeing some exchanges of words uh, coming from North Korea as well. Uh, let's get the details of this, Paul Kyung. Sure. So according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, on Thursday local time, Foreign Minister Park Jin and U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met in the White House to re reaffirm that the complete denuclear denuclearization of North Korea remains the top priority of the Allies. Both leaders agreed to sternly respond to North Korean provocations and illegal cyber activities. The two leaders agreed to encourage the international community to implement UN Security Council resolutions and raise awareness of North Korea's dire human rights situation. As for North Korea's denuclearization, the two were on the same page to make China play a constructive role based on the awareness that it is for the common good of the three countries. Jake Sullivan welcomed and expressed support for South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy and vowed to strengthen partnership for the sake of freedom, peace, and prosperity of the international community. Minister Park stressed the need to create an alliance that will help overcome the challenges of the 21st century. He also asked for close cooperation from the U.S. to make President Yoon's visit to the country a successful one. Regarding the Inflation Reduction Act, Park asked the U.S. to cooperate and come up with a solution to satisfy South Korean companies and further strengthen economic cooperation between the allies since this year marks the 70th anniversary of Alliance. The two sides also agreed to expand cooperation in semiconductors, space, quantum and cyber technologies for the common prosperity of the younger generation. Before meeting Sullivan, Park met pro-Korean figures of the U.S. Congress, including House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall, House Foreign Affairs Committee member Yong Kim, who's also Korean-American, and others to ask for active support to further strengthen bilateral relationship. It's also expected that Park will meet U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Washington, D.C. today, local time. That, of course, before uh, Antony Blinken heads over to China for talks there, which is quite interesting. But uh, this is the problem that I have. I mean, they're saying that they are two, two are on the same page to make China play a constructive role uh, based on the awareness that it's the common good for the three countries. But again, uh, we've seen... A good example is, for example, like the South uh, South Korea now under the uh, the current UN administration improving ties with Japan, and now we're seeing more uh, collaboration, more we're seeing more cooperation uh, between the United States, South Korea, United States, and Japan when it comes to North Korea stuff, and that's only because relations are getting better but when u.s is sort of pushing other countries away from china and they're worsening relations with china you can't go out and go china by the way we don't want you guys to get any of our semiconductor goods and we're going to be slapping all these export um you know restrictions on you guys but hey let's work together uh, to denuclearize north korea it doesn't seem like it's working that way and that's kind of been the, the frustrating thing uh, especially for south korea 
uh, trying to get U.S. While the U.S. is trying to get South Korea and Japan together, South Korea is trying to get U.S. and China together, and that's been even harder. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. At least the talks are going on here. Uh, let's talk about a resolution that's been passed in the United States denouncing socialism and also socialist dictators, uh, that including dictators like North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and his late father Kim Jong-il. So uh, let's, this is quite an interesting one. Let's get more on this. Yes, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives adopted a resolution condemning the ideology of socialism and socialist leaders, including members of the North Korean Kim family. Referring to horrors of socialism, the House approved the resolution Thursday by a vote of 328 to 86. That's a majority of 109 Democrats and all Republicans. According to the resolution, uh, let me just read out uh, one of the, the, the parts of the actual resolution. Socialist ideology necessitates a concentration of power that has time and time again collapsed into communist regimes, totalitarian rule and brutal dictatorships. Furthermore, it claimed that socialism had repeatedly caused famine, mass killings, and the death of more than 100 million people worldwide, and up to 3.5 million people in North Korea have starved due to this. It also stated that socialist ideologues like North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and his father and former North Korean leader Kim Jong-il, as well as Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and uh, Fidel Castro were responsible for many of history's worst crimes. Uh, South Korea-born Republican Representative Young Kim, ahead of the vote, said on the floor that uh, she, as an immigrant who grew up in South in the South in South Korea uh, during the aftermath of the Korean War, uh, knows firsthand of what she calls the horror, the destruction uh, that socialism has brought to millions of families uh, on the Korean Peninsula quote, under the evil regime of the Kim dynasty to now Kim Jong-un. And uh, she stressed that it was socialism that divided her family and friends between North and the South, adding her mother-in-law crossed uh, the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, multiple times to rescue loved ones from the, quote, tyrannical North Korean regime. My thing is, I mean... The U.S. has long, again, I mean, they've not been a big fan of socialism and communism for the longest time. And, uh, I mean, you think about all the involvements of the United States in order to stop uh, communist countries and socialist ideas and things like that. Uh, but why now, right? Why pass this resolution now? Because it's nothing new. And if you look at it, for example, like in a South Korea's perspective, and what we really want is, for example, the United States to work a little bit harder in trying to hold talks with uh, North Korea. Because uh, at this time, it's not something like South Korea, North Korea could hold talks first, and then that could lead to, uh, you know, North Korea and United States holding talks as well. It's not like during the uh, the previous Moon administration, right? And so uh, we were hoping sort of that the United States were going to work on something uh, to hold on. But when, when you're passing, <laughs> not, not to say that I'm for socialism or for uh, socialist dictators. Uh, I'm not <laughs> saying this whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, but I just want to say that it really does not help in trying to strike any kind of dialogue because uh, from what I understand, Washington did say that they're willing to hold talks uh, with uh, North Korea uh, with no preconditions and things like that. And they want to denuclearize North Korea. If you want to denuclearize North Korea, the first step is holding some kind of talks, uh, having some kind of dialogue in place. And I think this is sort of push. You're, you're going to get more response from North Korea. North Korea is not going to be very mm -hmm. happy with this. But you know, no, you know what? I just want to mention that uh, whenever some Something like this comes out from the U.S. I mean, there are many uh, similar bills being passed and uh, they don't really do something. I mean, it's a statement, but it's not that because they uh, have adopted this resolution that they're going to do something uh, against socialism. Like, Yeah, right it's, it's symbolic. But, yeah, That's yeah, yeah, a yeah. thing. But, yeah. And then, it's also, I think the media also plays a big role in this because uh, South Korean media, for instance, would headline this more than other countries. Actually, I found more Korean articles than the U.S. Uh, regarding this law. So I, I don't think a, yeah. a, an average American citizen really cares uh, about <laughs> this right now. Exactly. So I think it, this kind of uh, resolution will not do 
it, it wouldn't bother Kim Jong Un. No, 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 no. The, mm. no. I think it will. That's the thing. It, the, the thing is, if it's symbolic and mm. it really doesn't lead to much changes moving forward, if the U.S. House of Representatives passes a resolution like this, right, and they, they condemn uh, uh, socialism and condemn socialist dictators like uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, and if that leads to all of a sudden an uproar within the countries like in North Korea and there's a coup going on and then there's big changes, then it's you know, worth passing, but I'm saying like it's symbolic and what it does, it might not be big in the United States, but North Korea definitely reads stuff like this. Mm. You don't think North Korea is following up on this and they go, oh my goodness, they just talk bad about our great leader? Mm, I, I know what, uh, what, what you mean, but what I mean is that actually North Korea wouldn't even care about such a bill. I think they would. North Korea, <laughs> the, North Korea is... Uh, okay, let's ask okay, Mr. So we'll, Kim. We'll see and wait. <laughs> we'll see and wait. We're going to connect kind with of <laughs> Mr. Kim Jong-un. <laughs> but yeah, that, I, I wish to hold an interview with him. That'll be quite an interesting uh, episode here on Korea Now. Uh, but I just think, why why do more to irk North Korea when you're already not in a very good case, uh, you know, situation right now? Uh, you want to diffuse the situation. This certainly doesn't diffuse it. You, you might be right. It might not make things worse, but why take that chance is is what I'm saying here, and especially when it's more symbolic than anything. Uh, we're going to move on here. Uh, this time, Chinese and Japanese foreign ministers uh, holding talks on uh, military tensions in the East China Sea and other uh, items to discuss over the phone. Right, let's get the details of this, Paul Gyeong. Sure. So on Thursday, Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Kang and the Japanese Foreign Minister Yoshimasa Hayashi held their first phone call and discussed about several sensitive items, including the islands in the East China Sea. Chin told Hayashi over the phone that he hoped Japan could stop right quote right wing provocations, implying Japan's recent moves to strengthen U.S. Japanese alliance. As for the disputed islands in the East China Sea, both China and Japan have been claiming the islands, and therefore this issue has been a sticking point in bilateral relations for a long time. China calls the islands Daiyaoyu. And, Dayu. and while Japan calls them Senkaku. And Chin stressed that Japan should maintain an objective and rational perception of China and honor its commitments regarding crucial history and Taiwan-related issues. On the other hand, Hayashi reaffirmed that it's crucial to build a constructive and stable relationship and that public sentiment about China is not favorable in Japan. He also expressed concerns over Chinese military activities in the East China Sea. Chin also expressed concerns from China about Japan's decision to dump nuclear contaminated water into the ocean. It is expected that a foreign ministerial meeting will be held next Monday, the 6th, in Beijing. I think a lot of people might be going, how, why so many countries in that region, South Korea, North Korea, China, Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, you name it, uh, all these countries seem to have some kind of uh, issues with each other. And that's because it goes back to the you know history, right? The historical issues at hand. And uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> One of the reasons for why still South Korea and Japan, uh, there's quite a bit of tension on that frontier. Uh, we're going to talk about a new package of EU support that's been promised to Ukraine on Thursday. This is worth, uh, there's a number of them, but this the big one here is worth uh, 500 million euros. Uh, and there's other uh, support measures from the EU as well. Uh, so uh, let's talk about what this involves. Uh, sure. So the Council of the European Union agreed on new assistance measures under the European Peace Facility that provide additional military aid to the armed forces of Ukraine on uh, Thursday. Now, this came in advance of a summit between the European Union and Ukraine slated for this Friday in Kyiv. It uh, includes a seventh package worth 500 million euros uh, and a new 45 million euro program supporting the training efforts of the European Union military assistance mission. Uh, and the European Council on its website said that with Thursday's decision, the EU is uh, bolstering its support to Ukraine uh, to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, quote, within its internationally recognized borders and also protect the civilian population against the ongoing Russian war of aggression. And uh, this uh, seventh package is now expected to bring the total contribution that the EU has made under the EPF or the European Peace Facility for Ukraine to 3.6 billion euros. And also in uh, related news, the EU is expected to impose new 
sanctions on Russia. And uh, they are going to do this probably on the first anniversary of the war against Ukraine, which uh, so that will be later this month. Yeah, February 24th. Yes. is uh, They're, they're going to be announcing the uh, this is going to be the 10th package of sanctions uh, for Russia. And I think uh, it's now seen after a while you've seen it's not just the eu sanctions you've seen u.s sanctions and so mm-hmm. forth a number of other international sanctions uh it's really crippling uh the russian economy right now and the 10th one quite significant like you said it's going to mark on the on the very day that it marks a uh, one year anniversary of the uh the russian invasion of ukraine that's going to be on february 24th and another interesting thing that i think this is also going to now Putin's going to start sweating a lot because uh, I think uh, the European Commission President uh, Ursula von, uh, von der Leyen, von der Leyen uh, she came out saying that right now they're looking into setting up a dedicated center in The Hague. And this is going to be dedicated to basically punishing Russia for its war crimes against mm-hmm. Ukraine. Now, <laughs> this is big. And I think that's the other thing that uh, Putin probably has in his mind because I think his plan was like to go in there quick and come out very quick, but then it's been going on for a year, and I think it's uh, a lot of experts are saying it's probably going to go more than a year. And now they're adding more and more war crimes. The longer this uh, war goes on, there's more chance that I mean, Russia's already, you know, committed a number of war crimes out there, uh, and so now ultimately, is that going to go also go into Russian President Vladimir Putin? Is going is he going to be ultimately the person that is going to take the brunt of the responsibility for the uh, the aggressions in Ukraine? Is a big thing, and so. The EU is going really, really aggressive on this one, and uh, we'll see whether or not this is going to change the tides. Uh, but uh, we are cer- certainly, they are certainly getting a great deal of uh, support from uh, its Western allies. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Chris Rhodes uh, over in the UK says, uh, my mortgage is fixed. That's good. So like you got his mortgage fixed, so the high interest rate doesn't matter. But in two years, he has left in two years on that, will get renewed, and time will tell. Yeah, so hopefully things will pan out better in two years' time there. Guys, thank you very much for tuning in. I uh, sorry, <laughs> joining us on the program <laughs> for your report on some of these key issues. Have a safe weekend. We'll see you guys again next week. Have a good see weekend. You. you can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.